there's so many scholarships that the uni offers. I mean, they have millions and millions of dollars every year um, that don't even get allocated because not enough just, people apply, which is just, it's just horrendous. Like there's people that would have the opportunity to go to university, don't back themselves enough to apply. And that was what I did. I mean, as soon as they opened, I had, a, I set off a whole week. I just did applications all day, every day. And I probably did about 50 applications. In 1837, Horace Mann created the education system, a system at the time designed to pump out factory workers and professors. The same system that is still being used today in the 21st century. Now, man's system is backfiring. We are being moulded by the same industrial system that has existed for close to 200 years. That system delivers us into a digital economy that has no need of our outdated skills. This isn't our teacher's fault. This isn't the government's fault. This is due to a rapidly changing world full of technology and unforeseen circumstances. And us Gen Zs are caught in the middle. Welcome to the Driven Young Podcast, the podcast for stressed, overwhelmed young Australians, teaching you practical life skills you can implement now to set yourself up in life. And now your host, Byron Dempsey. Welcome back to the Driven Young Podcast, and man, this is a good episode. If you are in high school, considering going to university, or you're currently studying at university, this is a must listen to as it could literally change your life or your experience on campus. Today, I'm joined by James Walker, a mate from high school who's one of the hardest and highest performing people I know. He's a black belt in karate and in 2019 was ranked sixth in the world. He scored a 99.5 ATAR in high school. He was a recipient of multiple prestigious scholarships. He's landed over four internships while at uni, one of them with the United States Senate. He's been involved in countless leadership activities and is the founder of the company Ambition Tutoring and so much more, all at the age of 21. In this episode, we dial in and laser focus the entire conversation on university and how to crush it at uni so you are set up for life. We dive deep into how to choose the right degree, extracurriculum activities, joining societies, how to make friends at uni, how to take advantage of your tutors, how to land internships, how to build up your experience and create an impressive resume whilst studying. And we go deep into scholarships and how you actually have a massive chance of landing one using this simple strategy that we use in this episode. I could keep going on, but we cover this and so much more. In terms of practicality, this episode provides so much takeaway value for younger people, and I really, really encourage you to listen to the entire episode. Please share this episode with anyone you know thinking about going to university or anyone you know currently studying at university. And feel free to reach out to me on Instagram. I had about 10 people reach out to me last week, which was awesome. I'd love to have a conversation with you. Now, over to James. Welcome so much to the podcast. Thanks very much, Byron. It's uh, it's great to be here and to be chatting to you today. Yeah. Um, super excited about what we're going to be talking about today. Kind of be going into, I guess, more academic stuff, which I normally talk about. We talk a lot about entrepreneurial stuff, but kind of I brought you on because you're quite ad- academic and just talk about scholarships and a whole bunch of that sort of stuff. Um, but before we get into that, just want to know a little bit about your story, um, what you did after high school and what you're currently up to. Yeah, great. So I think... The main thing for me was I, you know, I went to the same high school as you, Menor High, um, here in the Shire, and I was, you know, always pretty academic in in where where I sat at school. I, you know, was in the in some of the top classes as a younger guy, but I never really pushed myself that much. I was always mm. kind of mid to to low in the pack, um, and always quite sports orientated. So I did a lot of uh, rugby, played a bit of golf, did a bit of swimming, and also just spent a lot of time doing karate, mm. which which kind of became my, my main passion as I grew up a little bit. So, you know, when I was about 14 or, or 15, that's where it really took off. And I kind of went all in on karate um, and got rid of all my other sports. And that paid off a lot. And kind of the main thing that I got out of that was really learning the correlation between um, effort and results and, you know, how much work you put in the results. And discipline. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that, that really did flow through to my, you know, my approach to school, my approach to life more broadly. And I kind of focused mainly on just school and karate and then you know also social stuff and things like that but my main two goals in life became you know school and karate and then from there as I got a little bit older again into into senior school year 11 and 12 um, school kind of took over that even more so and I you know kind of learned a little bit more about what I wanted to do at uni what I wanted to do for my career uh, all those kind of things and then decided that a uh, commerce law degree was what I really wanted to pursue and I wanted to do that at Sydney University. So kind of mid-year 11, I had, had the realisation that, that that degree is actually a, a 99.5 ATAR. And, you know, it was quite, even at that time, it was quite uh, 
you know, I didn't look at it as being something very achievable. It was mm. kind of high in the sky. And just to clarify for anyone, 99.95 ATAR. Just five, 99.5. 99. Oh, 99. Yeah. Oh, that's a ranking system in yeah. New South Wales is out of 100. Yeah. So basically 99 is one of the highest marks you can get. Yeah, so basically the highest you can get is 99.95. Uh, and that means that you beat 99.95% of the students who took the HSE that year. Mm, yeah. So it's just kind of a weighted average mark that you get, um, which... which boils down to the percentage of people that you beat. Yeah. So basically to get into this degree, you have to beat 99.5% of people. Uh, so I set that goal for myself because that was the degree I wanted to do and then kind of spent all most of my waking hours in year 11 and 12 trying to finish that and, and complete that goal. And then I ended up getting just on. So I literally hit it bang on. I didn't yeah. get anything above, didn't get anything below. Uh, and then, you know, started my, my, uni, my uni journey, I guess. And that's where I am now. I'm in my third year. Uh, but funnily enough, since coming to uni, I actually have pivoted a little bit. So, you know, after actually getting into the law and you know, realizing what it entailed, I, I didn't actually enjoy it very much. It wasn't mm. actually something that I liked. I found it quite boring. I found it quite unstimulating. And I realized that I was largely just doing it to have it on my resume so mm. that it would be good when I was applying for jobs. Um, you know, so after a bit of self-reflection and a bit of, bit of a push from a couple of my mates, I decided that I was going to drop that out. And, and instead supplement it with computer science, which is something I enjoy a lot more. Um, it's very logical, but also creative at the same time. So, mm. you know, you're solving a problem which has a right and a wrong solution. Like there is there is a, a correctly solved problem. There is an incorrectly solved problem in computer science. It either works or it doesn't. But the way that you can go by solving that mm. uh, is, you know, infinitely that's, diverse. That's the creativity part. Exactly. Yeah. So I really liked that. So now I'm doing a Bachelor of Commerce and a Bachelor of Advanced Studies, majoring in finance, computer science, and, and absolutely loving it. Yeah, awesome. And that's quite important. Like I talk about this a lot on the podcast is that pivoting is very, you know, doable and it's oh, something absolutely. people should consider because, and you know, this is kind of why we mentioned and I'm running, going to start running these events where we can link up past students with current school students so they can talk about and understand what the degree is actually like because yeah. you've got no idea what it's like when you're going in yeah absolutely all you know is that you're going to get at the end of it you're going to get that piece of paper which says law on it yeah and you're not 100 percent sure like what the, what the workload is going to be like and so i and i was seen as well i had heap, have had heaps of friends kind of pivot and drop and i guess I, I i'm scared for people who aren't brave enough to pivot or drop and yeah absolutely stick through it yeah and aren't enjoying it and yeah. then you know 10 20 years later they're still doing the same thing yeah and they feel like you know they're kind of feeling lost and like why am i doing this yeah absolutely. um do you notice that a lot in uni you see people kind of confused and lost in terms of like what they're what the degree they're studying yeah absolutely i think i think it's a very prevalent problem uh i think the first year of uni you learn so much more than you ever could with all the information days yes from course. high school like the high school uni run information days mm. like you know you go to the stall and they'll say you know what are you interested in this is why it's great this is why it's great this is why it's great um, but until you actually get there or, or you talk to someone who's been through it um there's not a lot you can know about how it's actually going to work mm. so i think that first year of uni is such a great learning curve if you're willing to take it on and adjust um, but as soon as you kind of take take that information in, but then decide, oh, I'm just going to finish. I'm going to keep yeah. going. Uh, I've already invested does, 10K exactly. in a year of my life into it. Exactly. It is a, it is a serious problem. Like a lot of my friends, um, you know, I'm in, a, I'm in a group of friends. A lot of us want to go into finance and work in finance, at least to start our careers. Uh, and, and a lot of them, you know, started Bachelor of Commerce, Bachelor of Laws, majoring in finance is a very standard degree at UCID, um, very much because they thought that's the best way to get into um, investment banking. That's mm. the, they, you know, that's the standard path. But, you know, two years down the track, I've changed, loving it, enjoying uni. You know, it's a lot easier to balance. I find it a lot more enjoyable to study, so it's a lot easier to study. Um, yes, which is important. Yeah, no, exactly. I, I say that a lot. Like, if you're if you're not enjoying something, you're competing against people who are enjoying it. Exactly. And how, how can you compete against someone who loves what they're doing and if you're yeah. not? Maybe for the first few years, but you're going to get burnt out while they keep going. Yeah, exactly. So I think there very much is a culture of, you know, people getting into things they don't like um, from high school, which, you know, that's fair enough because in a lot of cases, they just don't know what it's going to be like. Mm. But then I think the problem there is people who don't feel comfortable enough to actually change and, and make that pivot. Um, yeah. So, yeah. And so if, you, if we take on uni the first year, we consider it more of a experiment to kind of figure out what we want to do as opposed absolutely. to we're locked in. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why, you know, I don't even know, New Zealand, their first year of uni is free. Yeah. Doesn't matter wow. what, doesn't matter any degree you do, your first year of uni as a New Zealand citizen is free. Wow. And like okay. my sister, actually I could have claimed it because I'm a dual citizen, but my sister's looking to study in New Zealand. She's not 100% wow. sure what she wants to do. And as, you know, her big brother and our parents were kind of just like, well, 
your first year is free, so you can kind of do whatever you want and just figure out what you want to do yeah. from there. No, that's awesome. Which is, and that's just into bringing in, bring in that policy. So that's, you can kind of see that makes it a lot easier because you don't have that, especially I think degrees are getting real expensive now. You know, yeah. You 13, 14K for a degree. You don't have that initial investment. So it's yeah. a lot easier to pivot. Um, so yeah, I think that's a really good mindset that people should be taking when entering uni. It's like, don't feel like you're locked in. Yeah. Because it's a huge decision. Yeah, definitely. Like it's going to impact the rest of your life. Yeah. Um, and don't be afraid to pivot. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the, the value also in first year is that you can try and do what I would suggest is try and do a couple of elective s- subjects. So before going to university, I'd never been, you know, involved in technology or coding or computer science at all. Yeah. Um, had, had no exposure to it. Didn't do IST or anything at school. Um, but it was really just through, they have these like open learning environment units, which just encourage you to do something that's totally unrelated to degree. So I did you know, computer science coding. I thought it'd be cool. Um, ended up doing really well in that subject and thought, wow, I actually really enjoy this. Mm. I've made this game or I've made this app. Um, you know, that's pretty tangible. It's quite a tangible skill. It's and I like feeling. that. Exactly. So, you know, from doing that elective, I decided to change my whole path, right? Mm. If I hadn't taken that elective, you know, I probably wouldn't have known about it. So I think also just getting involved in things and, and trying to, as often as possible do something out of the ordinary or something that you wouldn't yeah. have considered because those are the things that are actually going to have impact if you do another finance course um, in the long run it's not really going to have any impact because you're going to learn that anyway mm. so. and tasting I think yeah exactly it's just tasting like and that's what basically honestly up until you're 30 you should just be tasting and tasting tasting figure out what you like absolutely um, I've been doing that as well and I guess I, like, I haven't gone to uni which is kind of great, great reason I wanted to bring you on but what I hear is from my friends they're like oh man I wish I knew I should have joined the societies I wish I knew I should have done this as soon as I got to uni first year I yeah. should have joined the societies I should have taken some electives I should have done this or whatever it is like yeah. what do you think are some great practical tips people can do when they're entering uni yeah I think one of the big problems that I see also just on uni pages and stuff is just that people feel really lonely at uni mm. because at school you know you're in the same class every day same group of people you know, it might be 30, 30 or so people in your math class, 30 or so people in your English mm. class. And you get, you know, you get a group of friends and you'll have those friends and it's great. And you've got the year group. Exactly. And, you know, if you're lonely, the teachers will probably check up on you, try and do something mm. to encourage people to, you know, make connections. But there's there's none of that in uni. So I think people that don't actually take the initiative to make friends and actually get out there mm. uh, and get involved in something that they're interested in very much find it a very difficult process they lose touch with high school friends because they're at uni the high high school friends are doing something else Mm. Uh, or they you know they come to uni don't make any friends because they don't get involved and then they only have high school friends and they just hate uni and they just go there to study and that it's it's just very it's negative i guess and i think think about it what i see as well is they have a lot of class friends like they just have friends when they're in the classroom and then yeah. they don't really see them outside or they're not really fr- they're just like friends when you're in the classroom and because as you mentioned at high school every every basically every day you're going to see the same people yeah d- depending on your classes or at least every two days you're going to see the same people in the same classes sort of thing yeah. but at uni you're all doing different classes a lot of the time depending on the degree yeah yeah absolutely um for example my mum was actually different she was studied occupational therapy she had the same group of friends for four or five years yeah. going through the same and they go on holidays like I've met all their kids. Like yeah. they're still friends today because yeah. that's so strong because they're doing the same thing. Yeah. But with a lot of classes, because we've got so many different options now, you don't see that because everyone's doing different classes. So you get split up. Yeah. And I think that's, yeah, a really good point. You yeah. Know. So I think, I mean, kind of, kind of to round that up into like a, I guess a takeaway would be the main thing. Like my first year of uni and all my subjects, I kind of just tried to meet one person or two people in every subject that I did. Mm. So I try and make one good friend in each subject. And then from there, you know, if I have that one friend, then they've got other friends at yep. uni or because a lot of people, you know, I come from a bit of a different background, but a lot of people that go to UCID um, often have a lot of other friends that went like are going to UCID as well from their mm. high school. Um, it depends on the high, high school you went to, but a lot of schools, you know, a lot of them go to Sydney and then and then a lot of schools, not many go to Sydney. More so, prestigious schools, a lot of people are going to Sydney. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So I think if you can, if you can just get one, you know, kind of get little pinpoints of friends everywhere and actually make genuine connections with them, then through that you'll make, you know, you'll make friends with all their friends. And, and that's yeah. kind of the, the approach that I did, I guess. I that's joined, networking. Yeah, exactly. Mm. That's how it works. I mean, I joined um, the Finance Society because that was something I was really interested in. Um, the Business School Society is, you know, it sounds businessy, but it's actually just a social group. Yeah. Mo- largely just a social group for business school students. So I joined that. Um, so I had something that was related to my 
you know, my career interest. I had something that was related to my social interest. And then I just got involved in, you know, all of the first year events. You know, there was first year welcome events. There was first year camp where you just go away with mm, all the other yeah. first years for three days. Like if, we, if you're doing all this stuff, you can't not make friends. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, it's literally a three-day camp with, it's like a school camp but without teachers and mm. you can do whatever you and want. You, you can legally drink. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. it's, it's you know, it's a great time. Um, you know, I met my girlfriend a couple of days before that and then subsequently spent a lot more time with her at yeah, camp. Yeah, yeah. Um, who I'm still with today, like the the opportunities that you can get from just going to these things and saying hello to people and actually just you know putting yourself out there is um is really where I think uni becomes a lot more valuable. So it's so important because I I think especially as Australians, like it's kind of changing now. But growing up, like there weren't that many Australian movies and stuff. Everything was Americanized, yeah. and Americanized is college, is parties, it's yeah. drugs, it's alcohol, it's a fun time. And then you kind of come to I guess if we're talking about Sydney. And not many people live on campus. Yeah. And, and like for us, it's like 45 minutes or an hour to get into the city mm-hmm. or get into the, the universities. And so there is not as much of a party lifestyle yeah. as what you kind of fantasize it was going to be. Yeah. And so if you're not making actively making these connections, it can be depressing. Yeah, like absolutely. You just, as you mentioned, you just go to uni, maybe you study and then you go home, go to uni, go home. And yeah. then you're just maybe on the weekend to hang out with your high school friends. It's Yeah, it can be quite dangerous. Yeah. It's very isolating as well. Mm. And I think from my experience having friends also makes the academics so much easier yes so you know making i've made you know in the for example through the finance society i made a a good friend who was two years above me because in obviously in the society it's not all just first years Mm. there's seniors who run the society it's run by students so you know by joining into things and getting involved in things whether it's finance related or whether it's just you know they have a chocolate society or a game society whatever it is um, you're going to meet older students and they're going to be able to give you a lot of these tips and a lot of these you know, this guidance before you have to learn it yourself. Yeah. So, I mean, and also with respect to academics, there was, you know, in the finance society, they've all studied finance. So they've all done the courses that I did, I'm doing now, they did them two years ago. Mm. So having those mentors, those people that I can just reach out to if I'm stuck, you know, also makes it a whole lot easier. So even by taking the approach and thinking, you know, I'm at uni to study, I'm just going to focus on studying and yeah, yeah. Um, even by doing that, you're kind of hurting your chances at, at you, being more successful. You're, you're pigeonholing academics. yourself as exactly. well. Yeah. And, and no, I mean, you're not going to make any friends. So you're not going to be able to meet the people that will be able to help you more. And mm. with respect to getting, you know, moving on from you, I mean, uni's great, but the reason you're there largely is to A, learn and B, you know, move on and, and go and start your career so or start your life. Your career, yeah. yeah. So, so by meeting friends, that's been, I mean, I've done three or four internships now and, and moving into that, um, you know, that finance space. And all of those internships have come from relationships mm. from someone I met, recommended me, got me in. Then from that job, I got recommended to something else, got in. And then, you know, another person I've met totally unrelated got into another one. So it's getting involved. I'd say, you know, the main thing for a first year uni student would be A, to, to taste a lot of things and B, to taste a lot of people. Meet yep. everyone you can. Um, and the worst thing that can happen is, you you know, you meet someone, they don't like you, you don't like them. And there's 60,000 people at the uni. You're never going to see them again. Yeah, exactly. It doesn't matter. So there really is no you know, no negative to, mm. to doing that. And connections is everything. Like you mentioned, you met one person and this, this, this. It's the same yeah. with me. You know, I meet one person. I have someone on the podcast and I go, oh, you should meet this person. I'll meet this person, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And it just, it, you've got to be open-minded to that concept. Yeah. Um, but, but what you kind of mentioned here kind of leads on to what I wanted to talk about next was so many people will just like do the bare minimum at uni. They'll think, okay, the goal of the uni is to get my degree. So I'm going to go, as we mentioned, I'm just going to go, I'm going to study, I'm going to de- get my degree. But I would almost argue, and I'll be curious what you say, your connections are almost more valuable. Like, because when you finish uni in 2020, the world we're currently in, your degree does not, like your piece of paper, your degree, it doesn't automatically equal a job now. Oh, absolutely. It used to kind of 20 or 30 years ago because there was way less uni students. Um, but now it doesn't equal a job so how do we get a job and then we need to be building our connections and doing as much as we can during uni so we're setting ourselves up for our career when we leave but so many people will just do the bare minimum and they'll just get the degree and they'll go okay now i just go on to seek.com or go into linkedin and, and use my degree to apply for a job and when they don't when it doesn't work they get all upset yeah and it's like well what have you actually done yeah absolutely no i think you know that's probably the biggest problem uh with the way things are run now you know 80 it used to be that a minor amount of people would go to university. Yes. And those people would, you know, have a great time at uni. They'd pass their degree, get a job. It's great. Um, But now it's very much that a majority of people go to university. And, you know, there hasn't been a huge amount of increase in the jobs that require a university degree. Mm. So if you want to go into something like finance or something specialized, or even if you just want to get a job at all, um, it 
having the degree is really not going to do anything other than allow you to apply. Yeah. Um, it's just the, the key. It's exactly, just the gateway exactly. sort of thing. And like it, I, for you, so on my resume, the, the degree is one line and it's a 50 line resume. Mm. Like, you know, the things that take up most time are my experiences, um, the extracurriculars that I've done, society positions, um, exchange karate things, like karate exactly. Dude, if i was hiring someone i saw they'd done karate like that's powerful because yeah. it means they've committed first of all it shows that you commit to something yeah. it shows you're disciplined and you know you're driven and that's powerful and adding no. that stuff on your resume absolutely i mean i had a i had an interview yesterday for for a job and the first thing he said was you know, tell me about this karate how did that go like how did you get into it what was it like and the interview was mostly just a chat about where my life has gone and where I want it to go. And they're not, it wasn't as much a, a test of skills because oh, I mean, people at people at jobs and people that know what they're doing, know that they can teach you what to do. That's not, you know, what you learn at uni, even if you're the best in your class is largely not going to be what you're doing day to day. Yeah. It's very much theoretical. It's very much um, a basis that you can build real industry capability off. Mm. So, I mean, what people really want is someone that's well-rounded, someone that they will enjoy coming to work to every day. So, for instance, in investment banking, you might be working till 12 at night, every night. So, you know, you don't really care how good this person is at finance. You care about, you know, will I enjoy having dinner with this person night after night? Yeah. Will I enjoy talking to them? Will I enjoy, um, you know, spending my days with them? So, I think the main thing in terms of getting a job is just to develop yourself holistically. Like, obviously, get great marks because that's going to be a great way to push you up the list. If there's 10,000 applicants mm. and it go, you know, it's got to go to 10, the first 5,000 are going to go or 10,000. The first go. filter though. Yeah, exactly. It's if the first you, filter. It's a, the, literally the first filter is, oh, you've got good marks, you've got a degree. Yeah. Now you're competing with everyone else who has that same marks. Exactly. Now you've got to differentiate yourself. Yeah, exactly. And that's where it comes into, you know, society involvement, sport. If you go on exchange, if you, um, if you don't have any hobbies, like a, one of the things on my resume is just largely that I, you know, I went to the uni games last year and played AFL. I never played AFL, mm. but you know, twice or three times in interviews, I've been they've been like, oh, I like AFL. How did you go? What exactly. did you do? What did you play? And I was That's like, it. look, I never played AFL. I had a great time. I enjoyed the sport. I got smashed a couple of times. Um, you know, huge guys playing. They just can smash you without the ball. I didn't even know. Um, you know, we have a laugh about it, and then we move. Like it just adds to a dimension to the applicant. Yeah. And I think a lot of people these days just think that it's. They're just looking at you in isolation, um, looking at your credentials, looking at your, your marks, looking at stuff. It's it's very much that, like you said, it's the first filter, and then they want to see what kind of person you are mm. because because it's, that's what's going to drive the there's decision. There's a the Buddhist millionaire he's called a Buddhist billionaire he's called. Right. I'm not sure, but he created an equation basically, and this is what everyone wants to see in a job interview: it's attitude times effort times skill. Mm. If you've got a really good attitude and you're going to put in lots of effort with a job, and you're skilled, and that skill is just a degree. Mm. Everything else is, you know, effort and attitude. Like, yeah, exactly. For example, before I've only ever done like a few job interviews because I've been self-employed for three years or so. But when I did a job interview before I kind of started entrepreneurial stuff, I was, you know, I was doing video, right? Mm. And I went for a video job where they required three years of experience. I was six months out of high school. Um, and they wanted someone who had, you know, a whole show reel and everything. I didn't have any of that. But I managed to get 400 people applied. I managed to be three who got an interview. And then from those three, I was one of two who did like a two-day trial. Yeah, wow. And that was literally because I went in and I basically just spoke to him. I was just like, like I don't have any experience. I, I showed him everything I've been done in high school because I was making videos all throughout high school. Yeah, so I you saw I was making even your YouTube videos. And stuff exactly, yeah. Video. And my yeah. goal for high school was I think it's more valuable for everyone to know me as a video guy who's doing videos than get an extra five points on my ATAR or whatever. Absolutely. And so that was my goal towards the end. And um, yes, yeah, so I showed him my the captain's videos I made. I showed him my um, body of work I did for visual arts, which is a six minute video. I showed him all that sort of stuff. And I just said like, I'm super keen. And I, oh, I had never even used the editing software he had used. Mm. And I got all, I didn't actually get the job, but I got really far. And I was basically said, Absolutely. I'll put in heaps of effort. You can also pay me half the amount. Yeah. Like pay me 30K instead of 55, yeah. which was still heaps for me. Cause I'm like, what, 18 or 19 yeah. or something. <laughs> no, exactly. And that just, you know, it shows, that's because you just got to be human. That's good. It'd be just be talk about stuff with them. We just spoke like me and you right now. We just had a chat, spoke yeah. about stuff we're passionate about. And that's going to get you very far in life as opposed to just the degree. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think that coming back to what you mentioned with, you know, at school, I wanted to be known as the video guy. I mean, that's absolutely invaluable. And being, you know, if you're lucky enough to be aware of what you, what you want that early, then mm. absolutely go over it. Go go one hundred percent on that because if you wanted to be good at video, you know my biggest my biggest thing with a lot of people at uni, school and uni and things is that they don't know what they want to do, 
which is absolutely fine. That's that's fine. It's normal. But what yeah. they what they then do is say, I don't know if I want to go to uni or I don't know if I want to do this, so I'm not even going to try at school, right? Mm. But then they don't know what they want to do, so they won't try at anything else either. So I think that, you know, while school is, you know, it's not for everyone, it is a bit of a, you know, some people might waste their time if they end up wanting to do something else and it, they don't need school and you'll be like, oh, school is stupid. Right. But you're there anyway and you're going to be there until you figure out what you want to do. Mm. So I think the best approach is to give school your best effort, whether you're good at it or not, mm. because it's going to open doors for you in the long run if you want it to. If mm. you don't want it to, no worries, at least you had the opportunity. But you know, you're going to be there six hours a day. So to go there and waste six hours of your day every day for like 13 years yeah. is wasting a lot of life that you could be getting value from, you know, even if it's something mm. you don't love that much. Right? And even if you're, you're going not, to be there. Even if you're not naturally good at school, like for me, example, I'm not naturally good at school. If you have like a good attitude and you're building a relationship with the teachers, once again, they could lead to something in the future. Oh, absolutely. Like, if, yeah. especially if you've got like a, there's quite, teachers... I mean, we weren't at the most prestigious school, but we saw that some amazing teachers oh, who absolutely. could get you, who could easily, from one recommendation, get you somewhere if you wanted to. Yeah, I mean, I, I had um, my business school economics teacher in, in year eleven and twelve was a phenomenal teacher, so you know he skyrocketed me academically. But also just through the fact that he knew I was keen to study as much as I could and work as hard as I could. So you know, whenever I sent him an email, he'd get back to me in 10, 20 minutes. Mm. This is how I can help uh, you know improve that essay or do this or do that. So it was very helpful in that regard. And then also at the end of school, I, you know, I came to him and I said, um, look, I want to go into investment banking. Do you have any friends that, you know, I know you studied yeah. finance at school or uni, you know, do you have any friends in that space? And he said, yep, I've got a friend who is in, he was an executive director at that time at Morgan Stanley, um, which for those who don't know, Morgan Stanley is one of the you know biggest investment banks in the world. Yeah. Extremely difficult institution to get into. Um, very prestigious, very, you know, like top shelf kind of, mm. kind of place to work. And you know, connected me with that guy and he basically had me into his office and connected me with four other interns that he had at the moment who were in the seniors of their high school. So basically through, you know, having a good relationship with my teacher and being someone who applied themselves, whether I did well or not, he, he respected the fact that I always tried. Because attitude. Yeah, exactly. I had that attitude. So he connected me with his friend because he knew that, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't slop around. I would give it my best and, mm. and be interested. Connected me with his friend who then connected me with four uni students who were where I wanted to be. They were mm. kind of like three or four years ahead of me. So, you know, through through that effort at school, I then got things that were very much related to my career and yeah. talking to people who were very much where I want to be. Yeah. So, yeah, and I can't understate it. And I think we, we spoke about this before, kind of just being like, is it favoritism from the teacher? Yes, but also if you go to any teacher and basically say, hey, I'm struggling or I need help with something, I think you would struggle to find a teacher who wouldn't put in hours, you know, outside of their work, their, te- their you know, paid schedule. Oh, know? absolutely. I don't know if you know Miss Hannah. She'd text, yeah, yeah, like, she she'd, re- she'd reply like 2 a.m. in the morning. Yeah. Like coming study during hate, uh, when our exams are on. She was like, guys, t- you know, text me. We had a personal number. We would text her at 2 a.m. with bi- biology questions mm. and she would respond to you. Yeah, she's exceptional. Like, teachers will put an effort if you actually go to them and just kind of say, maybe, hey, I'm struggling. Hey, this isn't making sense to me. And I should have done this looking in hindsight. Yeah. <laughs> um, but that's why I'm saying it now. Yeah. No, I think, I mean, even if you think, I, I think to think that teachers don't have students that they like more is just a... Is, is a stupid way to think if you could imagine that you were you know on a football team you're a new kid on a football team and one kid in the football team is really nice to you um and you know tries really hard tries to help you and the other kids are just mean to you they don't respect you they don't want you on their team yeah. they don't they're not trying hard you're obviously going to like the kid that's trying hard on the team right yeah, because sure. you're on the team as well and you're trying to win so i mean a teacher is very much like that if you're not giving the teacher respect if you're not applying yourself to what you're doing i mean the teacher's job is to help students learn if they don't want to learn they're not going to waste their time mm. trying to you know force you to do something they want to do mm. they'd much rather spend time with the kid who wants to learn wants to do the best he can or she can and and actually see that kid develop right as opposed to just fighting with a kid that doesn't want to develop yeah so i think you know yes teachers had favorites but it's not that they have favorites because they don't like the others it's because they have fa- it's because that they want to help people that want to be mm. helped yeah and, and know, they can't they can't put an effort to actively try help individually you know how many kids do they have like a hundred students exactly it's just not achievable so if you know if and how many out of, out of those hundred will actively come to them yeah three maybe yeah. four five if if we're lucky um but i think another <laughs> another thing is you know you always hear like 
the entrepreneurial backstories or any successful person at some point in their life apparently had a teacher tell them they weren't going to amount to anything, mm. which just seems like rubbish. I can't imagine any teacher ever saying that to a child. Mm. Like, it just seems like absolute rubbish. <laughs> and even the teachers I hated the most in high school, I can't imagine them ever saying that to a child. Like, they want to help you. Mm. So it's like, if, if you go and be actively help them. Yeah, I mean, a lot of... I mean, there are some exceptions where, you know, people aren't what they wanted to be in life. But I think a lot of teachers became a teacher because they wanted to teach. You don't become a teacher because you don't like kids. Yeah, right. Or for the money or the and lifestyle. Exactly. It's it's a, it's a three to four year degree. Um, and I think a lot of them have to do a master's degree now. Mm. So it's very much they've they've fought and they've worked hard to become a teacher. And for the amount of work that they've done, they could be getting paid a lot more mm. elsewhere. And often they're very smart people. So they could be getting paid a lot more elsewhere. So often they want to be there and they want to teach you and it's just about taking that opportunity to show them that you want to be taught mm. and i think if you can do that then you're going to get a lot of value out of it and the same yeah. goes in university it's, it's a lot harder in university because the lecturers or the tutors um you know are dealing with even more students yeah but at the same time even more students don't care and don't apply themselves yeah so just by that same token you can still get a lot of extra help extra extra support um, I mean, I know what you said. I don't know how it goes at other unis, but there's things called consultations, which are largely just where the tutor comes and sits in a room somewhere in the university for two hours and any student can come and ask them questions about mm. a certain course. And I mean, I'll go to some of them and they'll just be totally empty. The tutor yeah. will be sitting there for two hours. It's free tutoring uh, for two hours. And, and they probably have thousands of students. Yeah. Or, or maybe hundreds of over a thousand Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So I really do think that in, in any education, in any in any pursuit at all, I think, uh, you really do get out what you put in and yeah it's just opening up your mind and g getting rid of that victim mindset yeah you know people graduate uni and they go and as I mentioned they seek jobs they'll start applying they're not getting jobs they're like why aren't I getting jobs well did you join the societies did you take advantage of the free tutoring did you reach out to people when you need to help blah 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 did you do all this no 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 so well that's why you're not getting where you want to be and yeah. you're playing the victim mindset like yeah. if you just open up your mind and realize like they're and it, especially like in Australia um, uni, it could be anything in life. There's mm. so much free v and resources that we can take advantage of. Mm. As you mentioned, like the tutoring or, yeah. or whatever it is. Absolutely. Like, there's so much we can be doing. Yeah, I think taking responsibility is one of the first kind of steps to actually becoming someone that's that's going to do something. Mm. Um, understanding that if you, you know, just recently, I obviously had a very um, fit sporting based background in in karate and i was training twice a day and it was it was in, intense right mm. and i was very much pride of myself on being fit and being healthy and you know being strong and that kind of thing um yeah and just recently i i was i was out with a couple of mates um we had a swim and one of my mates was like oh i thought you'd have a better rig like you you don't look that great yeah and you know i think a lot of people now the culture is that like oh you can't say anything negative about someone you can't say oh you don't look amazing you don't look beautiful you don't you know you're not great at this you're not great at that um but I think people that are able to take responsibility for for who they are and what they've become um, can very much build from that. So from that from that, I was like, you know what, you're right. Like I've totally I've become really focused to academics and you know career progression, which is great. I'm doing really well at that. But I've totally forgotten that other aspect of my life, and mm. I've not been working on that. So you know, since I've got back, since that comment, I've started training. I've get, got that back into my schedule. And that's the well, that's the opposite of a victim mindset. Exactly. Right? You so you can take and, it's it's yeah. really a fork in the road. You can take yeah. and say, oh that guy's mean. I don't like him anymore. He said that I was, you know, wasn't in the best shape I've ever been in. Or you can say, well, you're right. Thanks for pointing that out. Mm. I, you're right. I've just totally forgotten about that part of my life. Let's double down. Let's get back, let's get that under control. So it's very much being a victim or taking responsibility and, and making improvement. Mm. Um, and people that are victims will, you know, they're the ones that will just not, you, know, you, you can't, you can't be good at anything. If you're just yeah. saying that, oh, I'm bad because of this, or I'm bad because of that, or you're saying that I'm bad and you're mean. Um, someone that says you're bad is doing you more favors than not saying you're bad because at least now you know that in that area you need some development mm. and that will happen. Um, and obviously that's different from someone putting you down. Oh, yeah, there's uh, a difference meanly. between constructive criticism and exactly. just trolling or bullying someone. Yeah. yeah, yeah. but that example is just kind of illustrating that you, know, you can take things one or two ways and you can either improve from them or you can get depressed and upset yeah. about it and this is i just want to point out that this is coming from you and i we, i mean i guess in the big picture of things we were born wealthy in australia oh, absolutely but this you know we were still went to a public school you were now t studying at one of the top universities and you didn't even have to pay for it did you because you got a scholarship yeah and absolutely. so you didn't even need so you didn't even need the upfront cash or anything mm. um i'll talk about that soon but before you do i, was, I, I kind of want to bring up the example you just brought up about the fitness thing because i noticed it's just like the culture 
is like you play sport up to high school and then you just stop and you kind of mm. go to uni and suddenly you've first of all you've just hit your age where well your metabolism is not really slowing down yet but it's going to yeah. mid 20s it's going to start slowing down but you hit an age where you suddenly start drinking a lot which has a lot of, a lot of yeah, calories a lot drinking. of calories yeah. a lot of sugar just you know, to get that beer gut sort of thing yeah you're drinking a lot um, you might have moved out, so you're not getting home cooked meals anymore, or whatever mm. it is. A lot of your lifestyle health decisions can go down, and we're not playing sport, and that just seems to be the culture. And yeah. I was kind of talked about this in a previous episode. I was like, why do we just like I did as well? Why did I stop playing soccer after high school? Mm. Like, why don't I just keep playing? Yeah, and no, I think definitely. I think it's something we, people need to be careful of. Like, when you're twenty twenty one, it's gonna be fine, but it's gonna catch up to you if you don't improve your life, your health, and lifestyle, and make sure yeah. you maintain that from early on and it's definitely going to catch up to you yeah i think the main thing is yes when you're 20 and 21 you can you can handle not um you know not being really active and not doing a lot each day uh you know eating crap food drinking whatever um you know when you're 20 and 21 you're not going to get you're not going to get any issues from it largely but the thing is that those are years you know from about 16 to 22 24 uh, mid-20s are the formative years mm. that you largely become the person you're going to be for your entire life habits yeah exactly habits yeah. and and for me um you know during these time i haven't i haven't fully just never done never done sport i've kind of been on and off a little bit um but you're right in that you just you know other things become a priority you want to mm. you know you can go out you know you're able to drive yourself so you can go out and have dinner at the pub with your friends every night if you wanted to or you can um you know eat whatever you want you can go and pick up your own dinner if you don't want to eat what mom's cooking or you can live by yourself and Uber cook your own whatever, yeah, yeah. exactly so you have a lot more choice and i think that at first it's it's great to be able to take all those choices and and do that stuff but then it becomes a habit mm. and if you don't realize that and correct it early it becomes something that does just flow on to the rest of your life yeah and i think a lot of people it's like you know i don't have time i'm, I'm at uni i don't have time to go to the gym or i'm at uni and i have this part-time job but i have time to go to the gym but like i mean i think it's very it's a very hard thing to say when you hear about you know, top performers in, in a lot of different things, be that um, people that are studying, you know, master's degrees who are still working, still often go to the gym that, mm. or, or do something or have some way of physical health. A lot of m- the most successful people that you'll ask or that you'll talk to or that I've heard will all say, you know, I always make time to prioritize my own health yeah. um, and it clears my mind and, and that the kind of stuff. So I think to say that you don't have time, you know, it's not very no, hard. You know, a, recently, the, the only way I've started is is largely just, I just wake up half an hour earlier and I go for a 20 minute run. Mm. And it's not, you know, it's not a hard thing. A 20 minute run, I only get four Ks. It's not, it hasn't changed my day that much in terms of, oh, now I don't have time to do anything. You know, it's 20 minutes But running. Fitness also releases endorphins. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, people, it's not the same feeling as drugs, but it it actually gives you that kind of euphoric feeling that, you know, like people are on drugs for. Yeah. Not to the same degree, but you still get that feeling of kind of euphoria after. I mean, it feels kind of crap when you're doing it, but afterwards when you've showered and, you've st- and you're, you know, it's seven o'clock and you've already gone for a 20-minute run or whatever, yeah. you'll feel so much better at starting a day. Yeah, really, pri- I think it absolutely, in terms of the positive impacts I've, I've noticed, it kind of primes you so much. I found that, you know, previously when I would work late and wake up in the morning, I'd just feel crap all day. Mm. It'd be a slow day. Yeah. I'd basically, especially working from home, I'd get up, you know, have a shower, whatever, walk to my desk and then sit there for the next day x hours mm. um, but now i get up earlier so i get less sleep but i feel more energized all day because i've had the blood pumping i've been you know i've been moving i've had those endorphins released i feel great yeah um, and also the other thing is that what you, a lot of people don't consider is that it's the discipline of doing that yes. positions you well for the day yeah so previously i mean i'd spend a lot of time i'd get distracted check my phone a lot or check instagram or check whatever i had to check um I didn't have to check anything. I just did it. Yeah, yeah. Um, That's but habit though. Exactly. It's habit. Yeah. And it's it's very much that you're just, you know, you're working. Oh, I'll just check it. And that's fine. But if you wake up and start your day with a positive decision, a decision that was often very hard to make, like getting out of bed, like no matter how many times you've done it, even when I used to do it every day for karate, I'd go to the gym in the morning and then do karate at night. Um, you know, every day I'd get up early. It was still hard every day. Yeah, it never gets to the point where you're like, oh, like now it's you easy to get wake up. up like a you know all yeah. blissful and everything. Yeah, no, it never it never is like that. You're always it's always a mental battle, um, and I think starting the day off with that with a win in that mental battle means that later in the day when you want to check your phone and then you think, oh, I shouldn't do it. I'm distracted because you've already had that win in the morning. I think your your willpower is much more primed, such that you have a much more productive day mm. if you start it like that. 
And we don't so. have to wake up at 4 a.m. or anything. No. If you're waking up at 8 a.m., just wake up at 7.30. Yeah, literally. I was waking up at 7 and now I wake up at 6.30. Exactly. And That's it's not, not... It's literally no different. Yeah. And your, on, your body won't notice a half hour difference in terms of sleeping. Yeah. I don't think so. Or if you do, just go to bed at half an hour earlier. Exactly. And the productivity <laughs> benefits that I've noticed have been, you know, way outweighed. I haven't been going to bed any... Um, you know, I haven't been feeling like, oh, now I'm late on work. Now I'm not getting enough work done. Mm. It's very much that, you know, everything's still taking getting done on time everything's fine yeah it's just that now i'm getting more into my day mm. so i think there really is you know no excuse to not at least have that yeah that. and they talk about i think the marine or something he talks about just making your bed or yeah, something yeah absolutely that's, that's the really important thing yeah they talk about just make your bed in the morning it's like yeah. why would i just like who cares about that well it's a little win and yeah. it's just like and i actually started doing that i can't i'm not sure of the difference but you know i just started doing it um, but yeah, it's, and it depends on your motivation. Like I'll, sometimes I'll be in the habit of doing, you know, run or get up early. And sometimes I won't depending on, you know, when yeah. COVID hit. Oh, and it's still everything. that, like I still have the same, like now I haven't got up every day. I still have days where I go back to bed Yeah, and that's okay. And you work on that, but it's a way that you can always feel as though you're improving and you know, you set a culture for yourself in the morning. So I think I'm a very much a big believer in someone who is successful at something is much easier to be successful in something else if you if you have a culture of you know i'm going to work really hard and i'm going to achieve this goal um, and you do then that was kind of like what happened to me in karate i worked really hard and i mm. achieved a goal and then i thought okay well what's stopping me from working really hard at school and achieving that goal what's mm. stopping me from working really hard in internship achieving that goal what's stopping me from you know doing <clears> a really good application and getting a scholarship yeah um once you get that culture of understanding that you can work hard and, and win that flows through so i think a great thing is you know, making that decision that hard, or it's not really a hard decision, but just making the small decision to make your bed or go for a run and then doing it means that throughout the day, you're going to be more likely to make the decision to, you know, stay disciplined, stay focused and get your work done before you, you know, watch TV shows or, mm-hmm. or, or whatever you do. Yeah. But it's setting that culture for yourself and setting a higher standard for yourself that I think is really valuable. 100%. Yeah. And um, yeah, no, I, def- I definitely agree. And that's a lot of, that's, that's all mindset stuff. And you know, once again, we're not saying you have to wake up at 4 a.m. or anything. No. Just keep it simple. Don't beat yourself up. Um, but moving on, you mentioned scholarships. I want to talk about, yeah. you mentioned something. First of all, you got a scholarship to your um, to your current degree. Yep. So, I'm, and, yeah, I'll just kind of give you a bit of context. I've managed to get a scholarship to uni, a scholarship to college. So, in, in Sydney, in Sydney Uni, they have residential colleges, which is basically where you can go and live on campus at uni. Um, and it costs X thousand dollars a year, but they, you know, they cover your food. You get to get involved in sport and cultural stuff, in you know, different parties, and it's it's kind of like, it kind of makes a full you need a full experience. So it becomes mm. your whole life. Yeah. Um, where you where you becomes your social and your sporting and your cultural stuff as well as just studying. So anyway, I have a scholarship to that, and also have managed to get a couple of smaller ones in different times for karate for traveling. Um, but previously, so that's kind of where I'm at so far with the scholarships. Yeah, and you were mentioning to me because, uh, like, once again, we're learning. We're talking about we went to public school, yeah. And so there are people who are definitely worse off, but there's so many people who probably listen to this who at least are going to public school. Mm. So like, it's very achievable. Oh, absolutely. Like, like don't like, let your school define you or anything. And they very much have scholarships just for public school students. Yeah. So there are a lot of scholarships that are just on a needs basis. There are a lot of scholarships on, um, you know, your level of achievement, your merit. And also a needs basis. And there are some that are just totally merit slash achievement. Mm. Uh, but there very much is, there's so many scholarships that the uni offers. I mean, they have millions and millions of dollars every year um, that don't even get allocated because not it's enough people apply. Insane. Right? Which is just, it's just horrendous. Like there's people that would have the opportunity to go to university, don't back themselves enough to apply. Yeah. And then. And it costs you know, them 40 grand. Yeah. Or they just don't go. Yeah. Which is even kind of sad. You don't, you know, they'll just never know that what their life could have been mm. and maybe it wouldn't have even wouldn't have even done that much but at least you had that experience and you got to taste that thing so you know and so how did you how did you go about getting a scholarship like if someone's out there going oh there's millions of dollars that like they you need so we're basically saying you need to get millions of dollars to give away to students to mm. come to the universities yeah. as a scholarship yeah. and every year they cannot give the money away because not enough people are applying yeah which absolutely. is insane yeah so i think i mean the main thing for me is that a lot of students either don't apply a because they don't think they're gonna get it or b because they don't feel they feel like they don't have time yeah. because a scholarship application is often you know you've got to write it up you've got to say this is what i want to do this is why i want to do it this mm. is why i think i've 
you know deserve to be at your institution because yeah. you need can I just throw in C as well yeah I think C could be you. they think that everyone else is doing it and there's a lot of competition yeah no exactly which is just not true as we've seen maybe yeah. for some but as we if the numbers show that not enough people are applying for scholarships yeah so, so as you were saying no no absolutely so yeah those are the three things that largely stop people from applying and I think if you just I think those things often stop them even from looking mm. so I mean when you actually start and you what I would recommend is just doing X uni, so University of Sydney, University of Wollongong, University of Western Sydney. Search it up and then just write scholarships at the end. Mm. Like Google will do it for you. The first click will be their page. They'll have a page. I'll say, look, you know, they'll have the marketing stuff and then they'll say, apply here. Just click that and have a look at what the questions are going to be. It might mm. be four questions, 250 words each. Yeah. I mean, if that's one Saturday, that's you know, morning. half a Saturday in the morning yeah, if yeah. you do it. And it could be, you know, twenty thousand dollars yeah i mean for three hours of work twenty thousand dollars is pretty good right so i think the main thing is just whether you think you can get it or not or whether you think you have time or don't just have a look and if you make that step i'm pretty certain that most people will think well, it's definitely worth my time for the 20 for the 20 grand it's worth my time right and let's say let's say you're just really not good at writing up something like that Go to your teacher and say, hey, I'm looking at applying a scholarship. Yeah. Could you help me? No, go absolutely. to your parent. If your parents won't do it and they're not very literate in that area, go to your teachers. Yeah. Surely there will be somebody in your life, your uncle, somebody who will help you write up that scholarship. Yeah. So I had one of the scholarships that I applied for was at UNSW and that was a co-op program. So basically it's $18,000 a year and it's three six-month internships that are included in your degree. So it's a great program. They give you money and they give you experience and a degree and you get an honours um, it's really good, but it's a very, very competitive process and I didn't really think I was going to get it. Mm. Nonetheless, had a look at the application. It wasn't too strenuous. It would probably take me a day or so. So I guess in the morning, what I did was I just sat down, wrote out a full draft in the afternoon, chatted to my parents, got them to edit it with me mm. and then still didn't feel very confident, but I went into my careers advisor at school um, who largely I didn't hear that much of, but I knew she was there. So I just you know asked the question and then she spent you know three or four hours with me just going over it, editing it, and, mm. and doing it. And it ended up being quite different from what I had actually started with. Yeah. But through talking to those people and actually getting their input, we improved and I ended up getting it. Mm. I, I, mean, I ended up going to Sydney, but it was the opportunity was there. So I think through applying, I mean, that was something I didn't think I'd get at all. I thought there was no chance. Yeah. And, and I ended up getting it, right? So I think if you actually put your hat in the ring and have a, have a crack, often you'll get more than you even, you know, mm. you thought, you were going for so yeah i can't i can't speak highly enough of just having a go at scholarships being organized i mean i think if you're in year 12 or year 11 or even year 10 now having a bit of research and uh, you know putting in your application as early as possible is great because then it's out of the way before your yeah your um, exam period. before your exam period mm. and that was what i did i mean as soon as they opened i had i set off a whole week i just did applications all day every day and i probably did about 50 applications mm. to all the different years i was Dude, 50 in. if you don't get a response or some sort of thing from 50 i'd yeah. be surprised yeah like exactly anyone exactly i think it doesn't matter what your like stance is you applied to 50 different scholarships yeah i did ones at notre dame wollongong um unsw ucid and and a lot of them actually have like kind of integrated programs whereby applying you know for ucid you apply for sydney scholars and then you're automatically considered for every scholarship. Hmm. So they basically take in through a big funnel and then send you out to, you know, if you're studying arts, they'll send you to the art scholarships yeah. or business. And it means you only have to do one and you're automatically going to be considered for everything. So Which means you can put a lot of effort into that one. Exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, I, yeah, scholarships, I mean, it's been so helpful for me because I've been able to, you know, I've, been, I had, I've had my fees for uni largely covered um, and I've been able to have kind of that financial security. Hmm. And what that's meant is that I've been able to spend more time doing university stuff, studying harder, getting involved in societies, developing extracurricularly, just personally, character development, um, and also working my first internship I did for free. Mm. So, you know, if I didn't have that scholarship, if I didn't put my head, uh, didn't have a crack at getting that, I wouldn't have been able to do all that stuff and I wouldn't have been able to, to progress as well. Mm. So I think the kind of opportunities, you know, you just think, oh, I can hex it anyway, it doesn't matter. But you'll still then have to work to, you know, to pay for other stuff and, you know, you might have to get a job for this thing. And it also looks great when you're applying for a oh, job yeah, if you've got a scholarship. scholarship. Yeah. It's like, wow, well, this person has taken the initiative to to do that application and then is maintaining it 
a mark such that they're keeping it, right? But we also associate, oh, only the top people get scholarships. Like, mm. I think, oh, scholarships, wow, you must be really good. Yeah. All he did was apply. Yeah. No, yeah. <laughs> He's the and same as this guy, but he just applied. Yeah, 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 no, exactly. And I think a lot of the best people are often kind of, there's that tall poppy syndrome in Australia where, you know, you don't want to seem like... You're arrogant, cocky. You're arrogant or cocky yeah, yeah. Or, or going for something that, oh, you know, what you think you're good enough to get that, don't, you're not that good, right? Mm. Um, so I think there's a lot of negative internal dialogue that people have around it where it discourages them from applying. But mm. I mean, in reality, there's there's plenty plenty to go around. Yeah, And we were talking about 50 applications. That's not 50. You don't have to write 50 applications because mm-hmm. you can just copy and paste so much. Work largely, exactly. Yeah. Like, you know, the, fir- the first question on largely everything is like, you know, tell us a time about a time that you've done something that you really enjoyed or that you were passionate about and yeah. put effort into. So I've just wrote out, you know, my karate story. Copy, paste. And adjusted <laughs> it, right? It's very, it's very, once you've done two or three, the next 10 are a lot easier. The next 20 are even easier. Um, so that's the thing. Once you've actually started and made that decision that you're going to do one, that's why I kind of encourage, just have a look at the application form, fill it out one time. Mm. And it's so much easier from there. And um, we're talking about, you know, three hours work for 20K. Yeah. Like exactly. potentially. Yeah. Like I just did that. I got the government benefit, $10,000 grant. Yep. And I had to pay my accountant to send like 300 bucks to send something in and spend a few hours doing something. I was like, this is going to suck if I don't get it. It's going to cost me 300 bucks and a bunch of hours. But then I was like, but I do get it. Mm. It's going to be really, really good. Yeah. And I got it. And I was like, yes. And it's yeah, like just kind of taking that step. And we're not even talking money. There's no money commitment. It's just like a few hours for, I mean, obviously it could be a day's work for a decent application. But once you've done one, you can just and keep going. Yeah. And very much snowballs, I think, in like in everything in life, kind of once you, you know, once you do that, once you make the decision to put effort into that thing, you know, once you then get it, mm. like it's great for your confidence. Like, wow, I'm a scholarship yes. student. Like going into uni, I felt a lot more confident. I wasn't as nervous about, oh, will I be able to handle it? Oh, this, oh, that. Because so like, well, I've got one of these scholarships, right? Mm. I'm, I must be pretty, I must be all right. I must be at least on track. And you get there and you realize, Wow, I'm pretty much like exactly like everyone else. Yeah, but at Even least it gives you that confidence and that kind of ability to have faith in yourself when you're yeah. going in. Because it is hard when you're first going to a huge new area um, with a lot of new people, and it's hard to feel like you're not going to get kind of overwhelmed or lost in the crowd. Especially when you're competing. Like I know you've got mates and people you're, I guess, competing with or who are in your degree yeah. who've had like you know over half a million dollars spent on their education since like yeah, kindergarten absolutely. like we're talking like 20 grand a year primary school 30 40 like what like thousands of dollars a year versus me and you i don't even know what public school is like what 200 bucks or something mm. for the year yeah obviously there's cost and it's on optional top of it. as well and it's, it's optional like, yeah. it's like a government school contribution or whatever yeah and um, it's like how can you be competing against someone who's had half a million dollars spent on their education which is you who's had x, x amount mm. and that's i guess that's a we call it like imposter monster yeah and so i guess getting a scholarship or just understanding that also understanding that the the main advantage that these the wealthier people have going to these schools is I mean sure the education is probably better and stuff but long term it's probably not going to affect them that much the main advantage they have are connections yeah are connections and just there's just a lot of the time there's just more opportunity to develop as a person it's more holistic experience at one of these schools so mm. you might be able to do you know instead of having just rugby league or soccer as a sport they'll have twenty different sports mm. or they'll have you know there's not just drama and dance, there's drama, dance, choir, Musical musicals, theater. Yeah, there's yeah. everything, right? So the thing about, the thing that I've realized is that going to one of these schools is great and it's kind of like an all-in-one package. You go to school, you get all your development, you'll get your, if you choose to take advantage of it, that mm. is, you'll get your sporting, you get your academics, you get your um, cultural stuff, you get your social stuff. Um, at a public school, there's really no disadvantage other than to get some of those things, you've just got to go elsewhere. So yeah. I got my sporting development through karate. Mm-hmm. I did not get it because I didn't go to a great school. I just got it through another avenue. Mm. I got my, um, you know, I didn't do as much cultural stuff, but I still got involved. I did I did dance outside of school for like two or three years. Mm. Um, so, you know, I still did all the stuff that you do and that you get. And it's very much realizing that, wow, it's it's not very different other than, the package that you take but the thing about mm. being in a primary school is you've got to be more of a self-starter yeah and if dude, you want like, to get that development you've got to go and do it like our school had nothing when it came to video nothing right like it was mum mum and dad went when they're looking for my sister going to uni uh high school sorry they looked at aquinas and they had like a green screen set up and they're like oh byron we should look at here man i our school had nothing for video like literally mm. didn't even have a video camera 
like I had to get, use my own camera. Hmm. Like I use a, the, a two, like a three hundred dollar camera on my major work. I still can't believe I use that camera, <laughs> and I still found a way to do it. Like, yeah. and none of our teachers knew anything about video, and that was just I, I didn't expect them to because it's such a, a niche. But you know, it's the same with like karate. You know, I just had to find a way to do it and yeah. like make a way. And I did it all basically. I learned everything on YouTube. Like for me, when I was doing my major work in, in video, in arts class, I just sat there on my laptop editing. Like the teacher didn't, she couldn't really help me. She was helping all the other students with their art projects. And I was just sitting there doing my video, learning from YouTubers and stuff. Yeah, no, exactly. Mm. And it, I think there's a lot of d- value that comes out of that as well in learning how to do something yourself and learning how to discipline yourself to actually get something done. Mm. Um, as opposed to having you know a path set out that you can just follow and, and take that. Yeah. So I think that was very valuable. But yeah, no, Jan's been a great conversation. But yeah. uh, before we wrap up, I always ask all of my guests one question. It mm. uh, can be completely unrelated to anything we've spoken about. Yeah. But what would your number one piece of advice be for uh, the younger generation? Like, you know, coming coming into senior high school, early uni, talking like 15 to 22. I know that's basically still our age. Yeah. But um, what would your advice be to, to some, someone like that? Look, from, from my experience, I think it don't don't focus too much on what you're doing. Just focus on doing it just doing it well or Mm. doing your best in it because a lot of people um you know they might do sport because their parents made them they might go to school because they have to they might you know do anything because they have to do it and just be like oh i hate this and not try Mm. but i think the the issue with that they'll say this isn't going to help me in the future right it's like how's karate going to help me in the future right but on your resume and everything well and it's just as a person Mm. that's part of me that's part of my character that's Mm. i mean what is any i mean we're all going to die what is anything going to help you in the future because in the end it's finished, right? Mm. I don't know whatever religious kind of things you have, but if you think you're going to heaven, karate isn't going to help you in heaven, mm. right? It, nothing's going to help you that much in the future. The idea, I think, is just doing things for the sake of doing them, for the sake of getting better, for the sake of enjoying the process of improvement. So I think a lot of people fall into the trap of saying, it's not going to help me in the future. I don't like this. I'm just going to waste my time and not try it, right? Mm. But the thing is, you're going to be at school. You're going to be at karate for six hours a day or one hour a week whether you like it or not, whether you try or not. So I think in terms of, you know, return on investment, you may as well put time in, you may as well put effort in and mm. get value out for your time because mm. whether you try, whether you don't, you're going to be there anyway. So Yeah, exactly. Mm. And as you mentioned, when you do this stuff, like opportunities just start opening up. Like this is the whole reason I brought you on the podcast. Yeah. Now if you want to go for a job interview, you can put a podcast on the application. Yeah, absolutely. How many, how many people are going to have a po- you know done an interview on a podcast? Like, yeah. It's just little things like that and stuff. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's just, you know, I think it so much comes down to mindset and getting rid of the victim mentality. I think it's, I yeah. think our generation suffers from it with comparison and Instagram. Like, oh, I'm not, I'm not on the beach. I'm not doing this. I'm not, didn't get the scholarship. I didn't get this. And so you kind of have that victim mentality. And it's also very much kind of in society now whereby, you know, you can't, you can't put anyone, like there's, the, there's no, if anyone says anything negative about someone else, it's instantly, oh, they're horrible. Oh, yeah, they're this, yeah. they're that. And you, there's very much a culture where criticism is totally just not encouraged at all. Yeah. And what it means is that when someone does get criticism, they break, they fall to pieces, yeah. right? So I think one of the main things that have been really helpful for me is that my dad has always been, you know, always poked fun of me for whatever I've done. If I was, you know, if I lost a race or whatever, he'd be like, oh, how's second place? All that kind yeah, of yeah. stuff. <laughs> and, it's, and, you know, as a kid, it's like, oh, that's mean. Ah. Oh. As you grow up and you think, you know, he, he was saying in jest, there was no issue with it, mm. but it kind of builds an extra layer of resilience mm. and ability to take that. And whenever he said it, I'd be like, oh, all right, well, I'll get first next time, show you how stupid you are. Yeah, yeah. So it's, you know, I think also taking on criticism in the right way and taking responsibility, like you've said, absolutely I'm invaluable. And that's, um, sorry, just before we wrap up, but like, that's something, because I came, from, I moved from New Zealand when I was 11 or something, and I came, yeah. and I remember seeing my mates had all these trophies, and I was like, Man, these guys are freaking athletes. Yeah. <laughs> nah, Australia just gives you a trophy just for participating. Yeah, I've absolutely. always hated that. Like, you, you do the bare minimum and you get a trophy. Hmm. I hated how in soccer, like, man of the match had to, you could eat, see it was everyone was kind of getting a turn. And yeah. it was just like, oh, this person hasn't had it in a while. We'll give it to him. It's like, well, was it really his best game? Did he actually yeah. deserve it? Like, the, it seems so fake. It's like, I don't want man of the match unless you think that was one of the best games I've ever had. Yeah. I don't want a trophy unless I actually deserve it. Yeah. Like, participation trophies, I just. I understand it's nice for the kids, but as you mentioned, it's just ruining. It breeds a culture of yeah. entitlement. And, and, and then as soon as they don't get that trophy, when they enter uni and they're not getting everything coming their way, they're like, what? Why, why aren't I getting rewarded just for doing the bare minimum at uni, as we mentioned? Why aren't I being rewarded for getting my degree? Yeah, absolutely. Because well, that doesn't mean anything now. It's yeah. just the doorway. 
you need yeah. to have everything else but um yeah no worries um, Ryan. Well, thanks very much for having me on it's been uh, it's been great to be here yeah it's been really good and if anyone's interested to connect with you where's the best place to find you uh look i don't really have that much i guess facebook just james walker instagram james walker dot r um linkedin very, james yeah, walker linkedin james walker yeah, uh, yeah. email is probably the best if you actually want to you know ask a question or, or yeah. get connected or get some advice about anything i'm happy to chat to anyone uh, if they would like to and that's just j w a l seven zero nine eight at uni.sydney.edu.au which is very i'll put that in the link i'll put that in the link and everything so um yeah happy to reach out if anyone wants to chat james thanks so much for coming on the show thanks byron it's been great that's it for this episode of the driven young podcast thank you so much for listening to the entire episode that means the world to me and if you got some value out of it please shoot me a message on instagram or reach out to me or i would love for you to leave a rating or review on this podcast so make sure you are subscribed and i look forward to seeing you on the next episode